just want to do a little intro because, you know, uh, we definitely have some libertarians watching tonight, but we also have some non-libertarians watching. Josh, why does the libertarian party suck so badly? Oh, man. Is that the intro you want? You, you, yes. Listen, listen, I could sit here and talk about myself all night. Let's let's talk about the Libertarian Party. So there's some actually there's actually some history there with the Libertarian Party and why and the reason why it sucks. So Libertarian Party was founded in the 70s. OK, for, we've only been around 50 years. So so people are like, oh, you've been ineffective, this and that and this and that. It's like, well, look, we're the youngest one of the youngest parties in the country as far as like, you know, uh, uh, parties with 50 state ballot access go. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, even the Green Party doesn't have 50 state ballot access. So so. So it's, you know, it's still in its infancy, but when it started, it started out as this beautiful thing. It was, uh, uh, you know, Murray Rothbard was a part of it. David Nolan was a part of it. Tony Collette was a part of it. I mean, there was wonderful, wonderful people that were a part of this uh, thing. And, and many of them were Mises, uh, backed kind of people. I mean, Murray Rothbard for crying out loud was, uh, 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 Ludwig von Mises's understudy. I mean, he took all of Mises's ideas and continued the work that Mises was doing after Mises died. Of course, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe took Rothbard's work and continued that. He was his understudy who came from the, the very, very left, by the way, Hoppe did. Um, but anyway, so, so it was this, this great idea to, uh, kind of, you know, show the two old parties, Hey, we're not going to deal with you ending the gold standard. That was a big reason why they did it. Uh, they didn't support the Vietnam wars. I mean, they were, they were really, you know, they were libertarians. Uh, they were libertarians that were operating in Barry Goldwater's Republican circle. Right. Right. And when the Republicans made it very, very clear that they were no longer going to support freedom or liberty or uh, economic freedom or liberty, right? They, the, these people splintered off from the, the Republican party. Some came from the, the Democrats as well. A few did. Um, and they decided they were going to start this beautiful anti-war uh, pro gold standard uh, liberty based party. And of course they're going to, they're going to give it the name that it should have the libertarian party. So <clears throat> that happened. And then sometime, uh, you know, down the, down the line, the Koch brothers got involved uh, and, and Mises and the Koch brother or, uh, Rothbard and the, and the Koch brothers did not get along. Uh, you know, the Koch brothers wanted to kind of do the same milk toast bullshit that the Republicans were doing. Uh, they weren't, they didn't want to be too vocally anti-war. Uh, they wanted to talk about these kind of woke issues that were arising in the eighties. Um, and, uh, and Sar and, uh, and Sar work <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, Rothbard said, fuck you. And we're not going to do this. And he left. He left the party. He left Cato. He started. He he helped with uh, Lou Rockwell to start the the Mises Institute, which is, in my opinion, the best libertarian institute in this in this country. If you if you're familiar with libertarian uh, uh, values at all, there's definitely a couple different schools of thought. But when you when it comes to like pure unadulterated, like unabashed, like we are going to stop fighting wars. We are going to stop letting the government. Uh, uh, give rights to screw us over to corporations. I mean, we are going to stop. We're, we're going to stop all this government interference in the market. The Mises Institute's the only one talking about that, right? And so he started that, took off from the party, and the party just slowly descended into this woke. You know, it's it's um, uh, second law of politics, right? Mm -hmm. Anything not explicitly right wing will eventually become right uh, left wing. I mean, that's kind of how it is. They, you yeah. know, and, and, and I know you, I, I had you on my show and it's something that we talked about because you had a fucking knitting club. Oh okay, yeah. Crocheting club that became a leftist woke, just a nightmare. Cesspool, right? Yes, and, absolutely. And then you're supposed to be talking about crocheting shit. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, and so, uh, so, so it just started to, to descend into this chaos. Well, you know, with the Ron Paul movement, um, in, in 08, especially, but Ron Paul, uh, ran for, for president as a libertarian in 1988. Mm -hmm. Uh, he paid his lifetime membership in, in gold. If you can believe that, <laughs> um, really awesome. I'm a big Ron Paul fan. Obviously anybody mm -hmm. knows me knows this. Um, and, and sometime after that, you know, uh, 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 Harry Brown was the presidential candidate in 2000, 90, uh, 96 and 2000. He was amazing. He did really great things. Uh, he was the only one in the, probably in the entire country that was brave enough to put out an op-ed uh, the day after 9-11 saying, hey, yeah. we're responsible for this. We're responsible for this shit. We need to not go fighting wars over in the Middle East. He was the only person, him, probably him, Justin Raimundo, and, and Scott Horton were the only people that were brave enough to put out these, these op-eds the day after 9-11. So uh, they were still brave. They were still bold. They were growing. Uh, Harry Brown had doubled the membership in his presidential run in 96. Um, and then, uh, in 2004, bad Narek, Michael bad Narek was a presidential candidate. He was a sovereign citizen for crying out loud. The guy didn't even have a driver's mm -hmm. license. 
Uh, he he had to be driven around the country to state conventions to try and get the nomination. I liked Bednarik. He was really good. Eh, he wasn't. He didn't have like the appeal factor, right? But he right. was a good, great libertarian. Uh, and then in two thousand and six, uh, some uh, you know kind of neocon war hawk weirdos kind of started coming back into the party. Uh, two thousand and one saw a lot of people depart from the party after nine eleven because you know. Uh, George Bush said, hey, we got to be patriotic. We got to go fight all these wars in the Middle East, myself included. I was I was 17 when 9-11 happened. Uh, I joined the military right after. And within uh, six months of joining, I was in the Persian Gulf mm. uh, on a ship for six months on, on the USS Constellation. I was, you know, my ship was a big part of the, the shock and awe campaign. So it really did. It really did give us this sense of patriotic duty that we had to go and fight these wars with people who were not even uh, the, the, the cause of of 9-11 right because i right. my 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 ship was dropping bombs on iraq right and in my opinion I, and i'm and i'm seven 18 years old going hey wait a minute i thought these were uh saudi nationals via pakistan that you know hijacked planes and flew them into our so so we're fighting a war in iraq and that was kind of what opened my eyes to all this shit but a lot of people left the libertarian party i mean they had a mass exodus because they were an anti-war party mm -hmm. and the, the country was no longer going to support any kind of anti-war movement all that anti-war sentiment that started after vietnam was dead everybody was pro, huh. pro war pro hawk we gotta go fight i mean we still had some cells out there you know the the you know bombs over baghdad people who were like mm -hmm. out fight you know in san francisco uh, protesting and stuff but it wasn't anything near what the the, the 70s anti-vietnam movement was right and so uh it started to die down and so that it was ripe for a takeover right mm. and so these people these coke people and and stuff started coming in and the 2006 they had a, the the national convention in portland oregon and they call it the portland massacre because uh they usually try to not have the the conventions on coasts that makes it a little easier for people to show up so a ton of people didn't show up and one big giant caucus showed up to the national convention in uh it, it wasn't even a big caucus but they showed up to the national convention in portland and completely gutted the platform i mean completely gutted the wow. platform they took it down from like 5 or 6 or 8 pages down to like 2 pages or whatever and uh you know i'm not personally against uh a smaller platform i think that's pretty it's actually a good thing it, it is the platform now is a little much i have to say yeah yeah it's a lot exactly, exactly. <laughs> but and, and 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 trust me it's it's a fraction of what it used to be before the mm -hmm. portland massacre right and so um and and so uh but those same types of people were the ones that started kind of bringing in this you know almost like a war hawkish vibe i mean this neocon vibe right and then gary johnson came about right in 2012 yeah. and look look i I was working on Ron Paul's campaign in 2008. Okay. 2012, I was supporting Ron Paul as well. But I was watching Gary Johnson. I was paying attention to Gary Johnson. And Gary was good in 2012. He was. He was mostly good. He hadn't fried his brain from smoking way too much dabs yet. Mm -hmm. um, and and he had some good talking points. He was he was vocally anti-war. Uh, you know, I think he was working with Scott Horton on his anti-war messaging. I mean, he was he was mostly good, but no one was paying attention to him in 2012. What's right? And uh, and so I started to, you know, after what the Republican Party did to Ron Paul, I started to watch the, the Libertarian Party much closer. And um, I ended up joining in right in 2015, rejoining. I had joined in 2010 briefly, um, rejoined in 2016. Um, and, and a lot of that was due to Nicholas Sarwark, if you can believe that. Really? I saw Nick Sarwark speaking at some conventions and he was a badass dude. He was, he was like, he was like, your, your tears are delicious and your parties will die and we're going to win. And I was like, fuck yeah. You know what wow. I mean? Like, I was like, all right, this guy's got me I, hyped. I, I was a Nick Sarwark stan. I liked him. Um, and then the, the campaign with Gary Johnson happened and I watched that absolute shit show. And I was just like, wow, this is terrible. Uh, and then, and then, you know, come to find out later that Gary only ran again to, to pay off his his uh, campaign manager that loaned him a million dollars for fucking some business that Gary started and, and, mm -hmm. and keep Rod Nielsen away from the party at all costs. But anyways, um, and then Nick started attacking people like Tom Woods and Eric July and Dave Smith. And I'm going, wait a minute here, dude. Like, I, I, I thought you were cool. What's going on? You know? Um, and, and he really is the catalyst for the shit you see in the libertarian party. Right. And I, I like to tell people, uh, you know, Ron Paul uh, got me paying attention. Murray Rothbard radicalized me, and Nick Sarwark got me pissed off enough to get involved. Right? <laughs> um, and 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 it's true. He was the catalyst for for both sides of what's going on in the Libertarian Party around. Right? He was the catalyst for all these people feeling welcome and comfortable in the party that were like wokest, leftist, 
uh, calling everybody Nazis and bigots and transphobes and and intersectionalist feminists and 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 all this all these all these uh you know these cult like groups of people who are like hyper focused on this one issue and if you don't support that one issue or even in your personal everyday life then you're not a libertarian you're a nazi and a bigot and a homophobe and you need to leave right right and, and so i saw nick was was doing this i saw nick was was this guy that was this catalyst for all this shit and and i was at the time working on a on a uh uh, a publication called Think Liberty. Some people may know it. Some people may not. Great friends of mine, uh, uh, Vinnie Marshall and, and Lonnie Dupree and Caitlin Cloven. We all started it together. And uh, and, I, and I'm going, you know, I've, I've interviewed some big libertarians. I'm going to start calling some of these big libertarians. Be like, hey, you got to run against this guy. He's fucking he's fucking everything up. Like, it's it's very clear that this guy is what's keeping this party small. I mean, anybody that was paying any attention whatsoever understood that whether he was a Fed or not, he definitely moved like a federal agent. Right. Yes. If if somebody was going to come into your party and cause absolute chaos and do the ass backwards thing of what you're supposed to be doing in, in this movement, it's probably likely that they have a reason for that. Whether it's right. a federal federal reason or not, I don't know. I can't prove it, but I have my suspicions. Right. Mm -hmm. And so and so um, I called all these big libertarians like, hey, you got to run against this guy. You got to do it. Like, you know, Larry Sharp and all these people. Everyone's like, no, you're fucking crazy, dude. He's a two term chair, one of the most popular chairs the party's ever had. He's a trial lawyer. He, he's a big business owner. I mean, no, you know, and so I got to thinking, I got to thinking and I was like, uh, you know, dude, I'm going to do it. I'll do it. <laughs> I'm going to run it. If nobody else is going to mm -hmm. do it, I'm going to run for it. And so I, uh, I, I help with the help of my friend, Matthew, uh, um, wrote up this intent to run statement. It was, uh, you know, had a little bit of a platform, the reason why I was running, you know, and it was basically like, we're going to run the socialists off. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was hardcore. I came out swinging. Like I came out fucking swinging and everyone was pissed. At me. But I also, to be fair, I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. Right. Right. Like I was like, nobody knows me. I'm like, a, I, I've written two articles and done a couple interviews with people on our little stupid uh, Facebook channel and shit, you know? nobody's nobody's gonna take this seriously and 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 by the end of that campaign i had traveled to 25 states i had spoken behind ron paul at a at a, at a ballroom at the road to freedom unconvention uh i had uh, endorsements from all kinds of great people larry sharp did my nomination speech at the national convention in in, in new orleans in 2018 and so it was like it, it like blossomed into this big beautiful thing but i got i joined up with the mises caucus at the very beginning of this and there was 55 of us in a Facebook Facebook group, we had no fundraising, no county or no state organizer, no national organizer. Uh, we didn't, we couldn't endorse candidates. We, I mean, there was nothing we could do, and it was just an idea in a Facebook group between Michael Heiss and a couple other guys. And then, and then I come along, and I'm spamming the group. I'm like, look, dude, you guys are the Mises, like you're representing, you're representing the Mises Caucus. You want to bring the Mises uh, uh, back into the fold, into the party, and make this a, a radical party again. Great, dude. I want to be your chair candidate. I know I don't mean much. I'm sure you guys can find someone better, but I want to be the guy. And so I took that whole caucus on my back and I traveled mm -hmm. to 25 states. I spoke about it to everyone and I'd show up to these states and get booed, man. I went to Texas and there was a group of people walking around uh, kazooing at me and shit. Like people <laughs> fucking hated me. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it was because I represented this this wind of change, this this group of people who wanted to take their little positions of fucking power that they had got themselves that make them feel special. And, uh, and, uh, I just never gave up. And I mean, they, they attacked me and attacked me and attacked me and called me a deadbeat dad and a drug addict and a, a homeless drunk who can't keep a job. And, oh man, God, they went after my grandmother, uh, like a, a, wow. a less than a year after my grandfather died. They talked shit to my mother. They talked, they reached out to my children. I mean, they really fucking did everything they could to fight me and the Mises caucus. And so it felt like an uphill battle because you're right. It is stupid. The party is stupid. The people are fucking dumb. They're mm -hmm. idiotic. They're 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 woke soldiers who don't care about fighting the state. They only care about their little positions of power. They only care about being virtuous and righteous. And 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 it's like, dude, we have a, a you know a, an impending nuclear war with Russia. We just went through two years of the worst fucking tyranny you could possibly imagine in your lifetime in this in this world. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, where, where politicians locked us in our homes, told us we had to take medicine that we didn't want. I mean, I, I, it just, it, it got so bad and here you are fighting me, right. Instead of going down to your local courthouse or state house and, and telling them to get fucked. Right. So don't tell me you care about fighting the state, but anyway, so I, I'm way, I'm way off here, but anyway, no, no, so, no. 
go ahead, go ahead. So that's that was the idea behind the Mises Caucus was to re- start replacing these people, and and uh, P- Pennsylvania was kind of like the that was like the, the well. Hang on, let's, let's hang on, let's let's hold on to Pennsylvania. Hey, you for brought up last I know, I know, I know, up, I know. We're and we're going to talk about but it because I was so I was there and it was amazing. But. That's a history lesson on why the party is the way it is. Yeah. Um. And and now you can see that it's changing uh all around the country and there's a reason for that as well and that's the Mises caucus so yeah i mean and i'm i'm so excited about what i'm seeing because like when i woke up and left the left which was a, a little over 2 years ago now you know i like when you when you wake I, I don't know if you've had this experience but like i really had no idea what was going on in the world and then all of a sudden i started red pilling and i started le- like seeing all the things that i had never been shown by the media i trusted and all this stuff and i started traveling around and everywhere i would go i would talk to people and i would always be like like i'm not a conservative but i'm not i'm definitely not on the on the left anymore like fuck them they're awful but like i had no idea what i was and everyone was telling me they're like carlin you're a libertarian you're a libertarian you're a libertarian i'm like i don't know about that the libertarians suck but i was kind of trying to keep an open mind with joe jorgensen and i was like i was listening and i was paying attention i was like okay maybe i can go that direction i mean like i i agree with some of this stuff i hadn't heard of the mises caucus yet at all hold on you'll notice you'll notice that i didn't even bring up joe oh and and there's reasons for that that's how forgettable (laughs) she was honestly i'm sorry mama joe but you were just boring and forgettable no i mean and it's it's true and it's like i i didn't think she was a bad candidate up until you know exactly what I'm going to say. We can't. We, we. It's not enough to be uh, uh, anti-race. What is it? God damn. I always, I always mess it up. Uh, it's not enough to be against racism. We must be actively anti-racist. Yeah. And, and Black Lives right. Matter and all that yeah. stuff. And, yeah. oh, and yeah. she and, and she ha- and, and I've, I've now learned that it wasn't her that actually tweeted that out. It was someone else on her campaign. Sure. But like whatever. Like when it happened for me, it was around the time when I literally went viral on the Internet for being chased by a Black Lives Matter mob. Right. So I was like, I was like, fuck this. I'm out like the like the Republicans suck, but I'm not going on this woke leftist bullshit. And then something funny happened. I was like on Twitter one day and Nick Sarwark, who I had heard of, but I didn't really know who he was, started attacking James Lindsay and just for like no apparent reason. And I had no idea who he was, but like I will have James Lindsay's back at any moment. I'd be like, fuck you, dude. It's because he's anti CRT and Nick wants CRT pushed down the throats of every child in America. And he calls himself a libertarian. So exactly. It was so ridiculous and stupid, but it was it happened to be the weekend before the New Hampshire Libertarian Party convention where he got <sighs> noted. That was beautiful. And, and so Thank I was you guys for that. I, oh, it was amazing. And I so owe I, you all beers. It was I I like I, I started fighting Nick Sarwark on Twitter, not knowing who he was. And then three days later, I start getting DMs from like all these state reps that I was working with on the anti CRT bill in New Hampshire. They're like, did you hear what happened at Libertarian Party? Nick Sarwark got noted. And I have like no. And I was like, I have no idea what that means. But that sounds awesome. And a week later, I think I was having beers and a pretzel with the Mises Caucus organizers in New Hampshire, and it was all downhill from they're there. Good because dudes. They're good they're, dudes. No, they're, 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 they're amazing. I mean, and it's like, for me, getting involved with the Mises Caucus it has given me hope again. It's given me hope that, like, there are people that do have their eye on the ball. And even though the, the Libertarian Party is a shit show, I have faith that it's going to change. Right. And that's because of what the Mises Caucus has been doing for the last several years. Well, uh, well, and it, it's it's so it's a different kind of shit show than it's been for the last twenty years, right? Mm-hmm. What's up, Chris? I like Chris Baker. He's yeah, cool. You he's should a, check out Chris's guy. book if you get a chance. I, mm-hmm. I have it around here somewhere. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a different kind of shit show than it was. Right? It was a, it was a shit show uh, of of wokeness uh, proportions for a long time. Now it's a shit show because there's growing pains and because. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's kind of the death nail, right? Of of this of this part of the party that's just kind of been stagnating for uh, you know a couple decades and doing nothing. Um, and now they're like, oh no, we're losing all of our positions of power. So they're like, you know, racist Nazis, racist Nazis. You got you know, yeah, this that. And they're all freaking out. Um, but they can't do anything. We're too strong. We're way too powerful now. Uh, it's it's over. You know, like like. And I was uh, you know, I I'll go back to Pennsylvania when you're ready. But mm-hmm. that was kind of the Alamo. That was kind of the last yeah. stand, right?